Hello, I'm Doug Musio. This is City Talk. Forget Barack, Hillary, and McCain. Iraq and Afghanistan, too. It's July, and are the Yankees through? If you're not into baseball, Billy, Reggie, George, Sparky, Bucky, and Lou, change the channel. If you want to be with one of the premier sports writers of the last 40 years, talking baseball, talking Yankees, stay tuned. Joining me today is Phil Pepe, New York Yankee beat writer for 21 years, author of more than 40 books, eight of them on my Yankees. He's recently published two welcome additions to my Yankee library, Magic Yankee Moments and The Ballad of Billy and George, The Tempestuous Baseball Marriage of Billy Martin and George Steinbrenner. Phil is currently a special contributor to the Yes Network. Welcome back, Phil. Thank you, Doug. I love the books. This week, 30 years ago, Billy Martin tells reporters they deserve each other. One's a born liar and the other's convicted. The next day, Billy resigns, and in true Twilight Zone fashion, after five days, what happens? <laughs> He comes back to be a manager of the Yankees. I've set the scene for the comeback. Were you there? Well, okay, let's start with the fact, with a confession. I did not make the trip to Chicago and Kansas City. I was not there in the airport. Oh, <laughs> I know. Is this one of the things that you want to kick yourself well, on? Yeah, kind of. Sure, of course. Uh, if I had I known that the, the uh, all hell was going to break, break sure. loose, I would have been there. But I chose, I, I don't know why, I can't remember whether I had other assignments or just needed some time off which, you know, occasionally you would get a little of that, and I thought this would be a good trip to, to miss, and it turned out to be not a good trip to miss. But it didn't take long for me to catch up. I mean, it, actually, even when that happened, I was called, and I had to write from New York mm -hmm. about this, the overall situation, and, of course, went right back once the Yankees got home, uh, and then that unbelievable day, uh, old-timers day. Right. Was, I mean, nobody. I mean, had, I'm uh, watching this on television. You're you're there. I'm in the in the press box. Oh, no. you know. And uh, what was the what was the reaction? Uh, there was a buzz at first. It was uh, the, when it was announced by Bob Shepard. It was almost like a, a, a momentary silence as people absorbed what was happening, and then there was a roar. The, the fans loved Billy, and they were excited that he was coming back. And he runs out onto the field. Joe DiMaggio was beside us. He couldn't you give me goosebumps. Go ahead. He said, it's, uh, "This is unbelievable." Uh, the players, one or two players, had an inkling. I think Sparky Lyle mentioned that Billy was hanging around uh, the ballpark that day and the day before, and he kind of sensed that something was up, but he had no clue what it was going to be. The idea that he was coming back to manage. I'm, okay, so you know the ba ballad or the battle of, of Billy and George. This is like a psychodrama. And it's not only a psychodrama with the two of them. You got to add Reggie and a whole bunch of other lunatics into the mix, Sparky and Thurman and the rest of them. Talk about talk about that team and its predecessor, the '77 Yankees. Just give us, you know, a little history. Well, I think you go back to uh, the Yankees had won the pennant in 1976. The, t the, the stadium had reopened right. after two years at Shea, so they go back to this renovated Yankee Stadium and. Everything is one of the teams started winning. Billy, right. uh, his first year, full year as a manager, uh, and that was the year that uh, they they opened the season in Milwaukee, and he pulled that great stunt where uh, Don Money had hit a game-winning home run, and <laughs> Billy uh, noticed that Chris Chambliss had asked for time right. out. Right, I remember. So, Billy pulls this out of his hat like a rabbit out of his well, hat. Well, he did that with George Brett with the pine tar. Right. Man. But here, this is his first. And he, and he pulls one and of those he, tricks. Uh, so he, right away, you get the feeling. I mean, his, the magic is back. It's Billy's magic. He's going to, uh, he, everywhere he has gone, he's turned a losing team into a win. Minnesota, team. Detroit, Texas. Right. And he gets fired everywhere. And gets fired. And gets fired pretty quickly. Exactly. And he, 
makes them win division titles or, or doubles their attendance, and he's gone. It's what, just a pattern. Crazy. So be, now the team is start, starts to win, and they you know, they won that pennant pretty handily, mm -hmm. very easily, and. Uh, so they do that, but they lose the World Series. I was in the, my first World Series game was Game Four, and it was just a four-game sweep, and it was it was depressing. They got wiped out. George, uh, I mean, was all over Billy, telling him, "I want a ring. I don't want a uh, pennant. I want a ring." And Billy was disconsolate. He he hid from the press. He went into the trainers' room. He was in tears. So now '77 comes along, and they hire and they bring in Reggie Jackson. He's going to be the right. the difference maker. And Jackson starts off really on the wrong foot. I think, and I fault Billy. For and this. Billy, when Jackson showed up in Fort Lauderdale, Billy ignored him. What was what, what what what's the psychological dynamic here? Was he racist? Was he no, totally no, insecure? No, hard, no. What no. was it? What it was is he didn't like the style of play that Reggie brought. He wanted, when they went out after free agents, he begged George Steinbrenner to sign Joe, Joe Rudy, Rudy, who was on the same team who was with a better Reggie, player, that, better all around Oakland, player, more the Oakland type Ace, of player yep. Billy thought was a winner, didn't uh -huh. think Reggie was a winner. But George, in his infinite wisdom, and I, I side with him on this, he was looking for more. He was looking for more than just. A player. He wanted a spark. He wanted a, a drawing card. He wanted a marquee name. He wanted pizzazz. He Reggie Jackson was the perfect guy for him, but Billy resented the fact that George d disagreed with him, didn't take his suggestion. Plus the fact when <laughs> when George was romancing Reggie and and trying to sell him on coming to New York because he didn't offer as much money as other teams. Right. Had. Right. Billy was sitting in his hotel room in uh, New Jersey and wasn't even welcome, wasn't even invited. Billy even made the comment, he's taking Reggie to lunch, and here I am right across the bridge, and he doesn't even contact me. So you've got this sort of love-hate relationship yeah. between Billy and George, and in some senses, Billy and Reggie and Reggie and George, this is a menage a trois. How do, and George is the very different George than the George we know him today. George is like comatose. Now, back then, he was Oh, his he hands was on all over, right. He's, he had his fingers in everything. Every decision that was made there, he had something to say about it. Uh, that Nothing was too small. Nothing was too big for him. And for all his faults, he revolutionizes the game because he sees, in a sense, the the need to spend money in free agent. He understood the market better than anybody else. Everything that the Yankees are today, and who would have ever predicted that there was a time when they, they barely uh, uh, drew more than you know, a million people. Well, the, the Horace Clark? Clark yeah, team. people were staying away from the yeah. stadium. Oh, because it was a dark and dangerous place. Yeah, exactly. So they said, but right. how, how we, dangerous is it now? I, forget it. We, we, go we to used to go million, all the time. Four, four million. million. Right. I mean. It's all George. All, all of it, this is attributed to George's foresight and his ability to spend money and his desire to win. And that was the attraction between you, you, I know you're going to ask what brought them together. I know we right. know what put what separated them. Right. What brought them together? Right. They both had this lust to win, this insatiable desire to win and be champions. But then, but they do it five times. You note in this, I mean, it's like uh, Burton and Taylor, you know, divorcing or remarrying. But they did it five times. Can't live together and can't live apart. It was it was it was totally crazy. Okay, so. The 77 season, the World Series. Let's start with the 77 World Series, obviously. Why do you got to stop before that? Don't go. We get, uh, I mean, there's so much material here. I know. That's Talk why fast. I can write a book about this. <laughs> yes, I, I understand. Go ahead. The Reggie Jackson uh, story in Sport Magazine. Right. The, the straw, that, uh, straw that stirs the drink. Go ahead. That started the rift in the clubhouse. Uh, there were two factions as a result of that, the, the Thurman Munson faction and the Reggie Jackson faction, which was a very, very small faction. Right, he didn't have too many buddies no. in that locker room. And all of the players had great respect and affection for, for Thurman, not only were they together for so many years, but Thurman was the leader on the field. Yeah, but who also was a little bit of a crazy person. Well, yeah, but he was innocent in this whole scenario. He, okay. he did nothing. Oh, no, right. Right. And Billy, who probably was looking for reasons to dislike Reggie anyway and to, and to attack Reggie, took Munson's side. Don't forget that Billy also 
decided that Reggie wasn't a cleanup hitter, made him bat six. Right, which was crazy. <laughs> which turned out to be, be crazy. Totally crazy. And I had, you know, cutting off your nose to spite yeah. your face. And I had one uh, experience with them in spring training when Reggie would make all the trips, all the bus trips to play exhibition games. And uh, historically, the stars of a team pretty much call their own shots. Right. They go when they felt like they needed to go, but if they didn't want to go, they didn't have to go. Reggie made all the trips, and I went to Reggie one day and I said, you're making every trip, that's unusual. He said, oh, you've noticed that, huh? I said, it was punishment. I, well, I don't know, I mean, let me, I, well, I'm, I'm sorry. I, he's, he's, I said, well, why is that? He said, well, it's him, you know, it's, the, he wants me to go. All right, so I go to him, I go to Billy. I said, how come Reggie's making all these trips? Why is he, why are you forcing him to go? I'm not forcing him. He's asked to play in every game. Well, now I've got two uh, explanations for one story. Who's telling the truth? Right. I don't know. Right. Somebody's not. So now I'm beginning to get the idea that you know, these guys aren't really on the same page here. Uh, all right. So now they go through the season. Right. Now, well, let's go to July 77 and somebody, Jim Rice hits the pop fly. Right. I was and, just getting to that. Go ahead. Exactly. That was the, the dugout scene in Boston where Jim Rice hits a double, a little pop fly double, and uh, it, Billy uh, deduces that Reggie wasn't trying, wasn't hustling. Mm -hmm. And so he sends Paul Blair out, Reggie comes out of the game, Reggie confronts Billy in the dugout, they almost come to blows, and... Now, and this is this, and this was a nationally broadcast, national and this television. was a big national, game. Yes, national television. Uh, millions of people saw it. These two guys going at each other. Pictures are famous. Uh, my uh, conclusion to the thing: Reggie wasn't uh, dogging it, but I talked with two key people here: uh, Fran Healy, who was an ally was, of right, Reggie, right, and Billy Martin Jr., who was an ally of Billy Cena, right, obviously. Right. And both of them agreed Reggie wasn't, uh, from different perspectives, from right. different views and different uh, uh, loyalties, they both came to the same conclusion. Reggie was not failing to hustle. Reggie was being cautious. Right, because he was a terrible fielder and he and, knew it. And he didn't want to embarrass right. himself. Right, right. Because Reggie always played hard. He never dogged it. He, he ran hard. He wanted to win badly. He went into second base and to break up double plays. He's not the kind of guy who would dog it, and he wasn't dogging it. But Billy was looking for something to attack to, you know, to attribute to Reggie. And uh, and and Billy Martin Jr. admits that Dad was wrong. He said Bill, Reggie just didn't want to embarrass himself. Yeah, he yeah. was pride. Yeah. So they get into this fight, and that really sends the whole sends the whole thing spiraling. Billy almost got fired then. Right. Uh, it was actually Reggie who went to Gabe Paul and said, you can't fire the man. If you fire the man... It looks like I'm running the team, exactly. right, right. So they backed off and they didn't fire him and everything, you know, now they kind of coexisted. Uh, an uneasy truce came up on them and then now comes the, the World Series. And well, before good, the, good playoff series against Kansas City. But he didn't play him in the I final know, game. I know. He benched he, him. I know. Unbelievable. And Which sets us up for the Exactly. Uh, for and the he's World putting series. his job on the line. Right. If they lose the game, George is going to say to them, because... That was game know, five. That was it. That was yeah. the concluding game. And his he, and I believe this, it wasn't punishment. It was Billy doing what he thought was the right thing to do. He had statistics, and they weren't big on computerized statistics in those days, but he had information or just a, a sense, sort of sense yeah. that Billy doesn't hit the pitcher, Paul split off. He's a left-hand and ben, uh, not, that Reggie. Reggie doesn't hit him. So he's better off not starting. And then he uses him as a pinch hitter. Reggie got a big hit. Right. right. And they tied the game the next inning. Yeah, and then they won it. And, and then they win it. Yeah. Right. So they win the Okay, bet. so they go into the World Series. So and then talk Reggie about Reggie has that phenomenal. Is that the is that the most were you there? To, oh yeah. Sure. Is, is that the most exciting baseball single event that you've ever been at? Yeah, it was for me. And maybe because I was covering the team. I mean, you have to think of things like uh, Mazeroski's home run and Kurt Gibson's or, home run. Or the run. ball that hits Kubek in the throat or before Mazeroski's home run. Or Carlton Fisk's home run. Right. There have been a lot right. of them, but right. for me, that was the, the greatest performance. Okay, start with the game before the big game. Well, what he, he, they, they got blown out in, in L.A. 
and they had to come back to New York to uh, to win the World Series. But, but uh, they got blown out. But in the last at bat, his final at bat, Reggie hit a home run. Right so, on the first pitch. On the first pitch. So consequently, he hit. Four consecutive home well, runs. Talk about him getting, I mean, the, he gets up the first time and he hits up, and it was off three, four He different, walked his first time. Right, and then he hit the three consecutive. Three consecutive. So he then, therefore, had hit four consecutive home, no, home runs and four consecutive official plate appearances or four different pitches on, on four, four pitches. On, on four <laughs> pitches. So the greatest, greatest performance in one. I think so. so. he becomes Mr. October. Yes. Okay. And the phenomenal thing about it at the end is now the, the, the uh, well, first of all, if you go back and look at the tape, he comes into the dugout after each home run and Billy's patting him, hugging him, you know. <laughs> Wait a minute. These, what are these two guys who are trying to kill each right. other just a few months ago? Well, that's the the ebb and flow of, sure. a, of a baseball season. Uh, but to me, the most remarkable thing was the game was over. Everybody had, I'd written my story. Uh, it was maybe two hours after the final out. The Yankees are champions. And I walk into Billy Martin's office, and who's sitting on the couch there in his undershirt and his baseball pants? Reggie Jackson. And these two guys are making nice, nice to each other, like you know, is a, a reconciliation. They were well. They just made history yeah, and exactly. then made their fame. And some of the things that were being said, he said, you know, yeah, we Billy's tough and I'm tough. He's feisty and I'm feisty. But we got past our problems, and next year is going to be it's going to be bigger and greater than ever. Ball. Yeah. yeah. Well, okay. we didn't know at the time. Right. And Billy is saying, yeah, you know, and I'm really upset with you because you broke my World Series record. Most hits in a in a, in a Whatever. series. Uh, but everything, I mean, they, they, they pledged their fidelity to one another. This is going to be forever, and the, well, that didn't last. Okay, so I'm at the opening day on the 78th season. What, 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 is, what is remarkable about that? Uh, well, listen, it was the uh, Reggie Bar, and, and I remember. And we all got Reggie Bars walking in, little patties of chocolate with nuts and nougat and Well, I, and I happen to have been. And I a, got one. Go ahead. <laughs> but I ate mine. <laughs> Go ahead. I happen to have been in a group of writers, about six or seven of us, when Reggie made, uttered his famous line, if I played in New York, they'd name a candy bar after right. me. Uh, it was at the the final game. I guess it was the well. No, it was before the before the playoff game between Oakland and Boston in Fenway Park in 1975. They were playing for the American League Championship mm -hmm. Series, and Reggie comes out to watch the Red Sox hit and takes a seat behind third base in this empty ballpark. Takes a seat behind third base watching the Red Sox hit. But I think it was more than that. I think Reggie knew that he would attract the crowd, which he always did. So. Next thing you know, here were a group of writers. I was one of them. We go over and we start talking to him, and we knew that he was facing free agency and something was going to happen, and the Yankees were interested in him, and he was interested in them, and so on and so forth. And we were questioning him about that, and that's when he said, if I played in New York, they'd name a candy bar after me, which had which is a, 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 an observation with such insight. Right. I mean, it goes back to... The Babe Ruth Bar, sure. the baby, was it? It wasn't named for Babe. No, it was, it was named, named for supposedly Grover, Grover Cleveland's, Cleveland's daughter, illegitimate right. daughter, or whatever. Something. Right? Uh, yeah, and it, it, but still, it, in uh, in baseball law, in United States law, that was the belief right. that it was named. For, and Reggie was aware right. of that, which is right. unusual for a baseball player. Right? No, he's a very smart yeah. guy, and he reminded people of that. Yeah. And so I thought it was just a, a wonderful line, and sure enough, he becomes a Yankee, and sure enough, they name a candy bar. And he hits a home run, and, and all, all the candy goes on the field. The field. As I said, I, I wasn't one of them. I, I had eaten mine. <laughs> Ron Guidry. This is the, the season of Ron Guidry. Talk about Ron Guidry. Well, again, who do you believe? I remember talking. Guidry pitched in, you know that he had a, a phenomenal uh, minor league record. Right. And then he came up and suddenly can't get anybody out. Right. And he's not doing very well. Is he a reliever? Is he a starter? Blah, blah, blah. One, one thing or another. Uh, and the Yankees were getting tired of waiting. Right. And he got, I remember a game in Lakeland in spring training and he got lit up. And the word was out that he's gone. He's out of here. And I, I also remember talking to, well, 
fast forward, suddenly he starts pitching, and they desperate, and they needed a starter. Right. They use him, and he does a great yep. job. And the next thing you know, he's become the star pitcher. Yeah. Well, now that that's happened, I several of us started doing some investigating. How come he didn't get traded? Who wanted him traded? According to Steinbrenner, I wanted to keep him, but it was Gabe and Billy who wanted to trade him. But I told him, no, you can't trade him. Okay. Go to Gabe Paul. Tell him the story. Billy and George wanted him out of here. I told him, no, he's got too much ability. You keep him. Okay. Go to Billy. What'd you, what was the reason? What turned things around? George and Gabe wanted to trade him. I told him, you better not. He's too good. He's going to be a good pitcher. Now, who's telling the truth? I don't know. But 78, he has one of the truly great seasons. One of I the mean, great in seasons. In my ever. lifetime, the, the Gibson season and the co one of the Koufax seasons were the... What, what, no. But this the was... The greatest bad. season oh, in God. the history of baseball. Oh, no, great I, pitcher. Go ahead. Was Steve Carlton in 1972. Oh, with the terrible team, you're right. 27 yeah. wins, the team won 59. Yeah. Okay, you're right. You're right. Ferguson can... Jenkins is another one of these guys who pitched with a really terrible yeah, team. Yeah, a lot of them. Some guys did, but nobody yeah. ever no, won that's good. The, the, uh, 42 percent of his team's, team's games. games. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Talk about Gidry, though. Uh, phenomenal. He was just phenomenal. Great one loss. Tremendous ERA. 25 and three. Lost three games that season, all to a guy named Mike. Mike Flanagan. Not, not a bad pitcher. Mike Caldwell from, Bo from Milwaukee. And I can't remember, but it was, it was the California Angels. Mike, uh, I can't, it's names. But anyway, it was just, right. just a little trivia question. So Billy, we opened the show. Well, Billy, but, but, go ahead. But, but Kendry is, he's a little bit of a guy. He's like 165 right. pounds, and he could throw so hard and had a great slider. And I was at the game. When he struck out 18 batters, it was... California Angels. Yeah, yeah. it was uh, spine tingling. It was just incredible. Uh, and that was the, the first time I ever heard a crowd, or what, saw a crowd, rise up with two strikes on a batter and encourage the pitcher. And now it's, now now it's, it's common, common practice. Exactly. And, that, and he was just phenomenal. The Yankees fall way behind. Red Sox are in the lead. We're in August, and we all think the, the Yankees are fans. What happened was the, Red, the Yankees had a lot of injuries in the first half of the season, and the, and the uh, Red Sox had hardly any. By the middle of the season, the Yankees' injuries started to heal, and their players started coming back. And all of a sudden, the Red Sox started to have injuries. It so they make, they're, making, they're making the move in August, and they're closing the gap, and then they come into this, that, that what's known as the Boston, Boston Massacre. Boston Massacre, the four-game sweep in Fenway Park, which is unthinkable. So they, then the Yankees go, and people sometimes don't, re, don't remember this, that the Yankees were ahead. They, they took a Absolutely. lead on Boston. With about right. a week to go, they had about a two-and-a-half game yeah, lead, and the Red Sox they, came back. Right, and they, and, and they tie. They come to the final day of the season, and the Yankees just needed to win the game to clinch the division, and they lost to the Indians and a pitcher named Rick Waits while the Red Sox won, and that caused the, uh, created a tie. And, and, you were in, and then you, did, you had the one-game playoff. One-game playoff. And you were in Fenway? I was in Fenway, but not working for the Daily News. We were on strike. Right, the news. That's what saved that team. You so guys were not writing so stories. So they say. That was it. That's exactly <laughs> there right. There were strike papers. Which yeah, didn't but have come the circulation. on. Right. I mean, come on. But uh, yes, and but I was But you guys there. not throwing, you know, gasoline on the fire yeah. is probably so allowed to say, do it. Possibly. Yeah, I think that it's, it's got credence. But, uh, uh, oh, but nobody paid attention to it at the time. But they had a coin flip to determine what if this thing ends in a tie? Who's going to? Where's the game going to be played? Who's going to be the home? And the Red Sox won that, and we didn't pay much attention to it until suddenly there was a tie, and uh oh, have to go to Fenway Park. That's going to be tough to win a game in Fenway Park, even though, forget the, the, the Boston Massacre, that was uh, water under the bridge. Beating them there, but Red, Gidry pitching with three days rest on short rest, and that phenomenal game and the play for Lou Pinella in right field. And they couldn't see the line drive base hit that uh, right. Jim Rice right. got. He stuck up his glove. And, and it landed in. <laughs> Yankee luck, you know, Yankee uh, karma. Right. And they win that game, and then you know they go on to the to the World Series. And of course, Bob Lemon. We forgot to talk about right. It. Bob Lemon took over the team, and he, you know, he's got the job. And then four days after he gets the job, well, one thing people they, they know he's going to be out of it. People 
fail to remember, although Billy always reminded people that when he was fired or resigned, however you want to call it, they had won five in a row. Right. And he's he was convinced to his to his dying day that they would have turned it around with with him just as they uh -huh. did it with. Lee. Okay. One thing that I remember of the and then we've only got a couple of more minutes left. In that game, that series was interesting because I was there for three of the for the, for the home games. That's why it was, was interesting the, because the, you were there. No, <laughs> the Reggie Thigh game and the Nettles game, one of the great defensive yeah. games of all time. I mean, we were on the third, you know, on the third base side of the field about 30 rows up and we saw it and then Reggie's you know sacrifice thigh where he gets in the way of the ball we didn't know what was going on yeah well it was hard to even in the press box it was hard to know when we had replay so we were able to see it yeah he he claims and I have no reason to doubt him that he did it deliberately he kind of gave him, gave him a yeah, little hip yeah, jack and, and the ball hit his thigh and uh, uh, it was a big play in the game. You're right, but Nettles. I thought that was Nettles was phenomenal. That's that uh, one game in particular, but the whole series. Right, and if he would have gotten more than one hit and twenty some on at bats, he would have been the MVP. Yeah, yeah. We've got a minute to go, and we haven't even <laughs> talked about greatest ma magic. Well, we did talk about great. A lot of those right, things but are I mean, in there. Some of them weren't there. I got one question for you. New stadium. What do you think of the whole idea? Well, I, I have mixed emotions, but I understand progress, but I'm such a traditionalist. Oh, man, you know. how do they do it? I know. I, I mean, I wish Ebbets Field and Polo Grounds were still I mean, around. But it's sacred ground. What's wrong with that I know, money? I know. I just, but it's it's all money motivated. They're going to have luxury boxes that are going to be very, very And how expensive. much is a seat going to cost? I can't take my kids to a game. Minor league games. Forget it. Yeah. Okay. I, I know I'm running over. 20 seconds. I'm going to complain. The most annoying thing about modern Major League Baseball is all the noise. What's wrong with them? They, there's no silences in the game. Baseball, in between pitches, all this is going on, and they have all this noise. I, that's why I don't what go to are games. Do? I, I don't go to games. You don't go to games. It's no. annoying. Isn't it annoying? Yes. It's terrible. It's not necessary. It's totally terrible. I go to minor. I go to uh, Sandlot games, American Legion. I go to A Ball in Oneonta, New York. That's a good idea. I go uh, watch my grandson play American Legion. Absolutely, <laughs> Phil. Thank you. Hello, I'm Doug Musio. Let us know what you think about this show. You can reach us at cuny.tv. When you get there, click on the bar that says contact us and send your email. Whatever it is, thanks, no thanks, obnoxious, do it. Send it.